Welcome. I'm assuming that we're live and we've got just 30 seconds until we start and Stephen says we're live. So it's at least me and Stephen here. Yay. So happy to see you, Stephen. <laughs> so um, again, we've got uh, just a few seconds and then we'll get started with our talk today. Yeah, here we go. One more. Five. Four. <laughs> All right. Here we go. It's four o'clock. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Venable Jampa, uh, Jampa Sangmo, and I am here via Seishi Ling in San Francisco with the help of Stephen Butler and of course the amazing Venable Carol, the director of the center, and Lynn and Mary Ellen who make up the team that makes everything happen there. So thank you so much to Seisha Ling, okay? And of course Facebook because we wouldn't be here without Facebook, we have to admit that. So I thought, uh, Lisa's watching, yay. Um, I thought, let's just start with three deep breaths, um, um, just to arrive in this virtual space that we're all in together. And then on each exhale, let's remind ourselves that we're trying to release as much tension as possible just to come together as a community here. So in, out, in, out and on this next one really try and release any tension that you're carrying in your body in out so um i hope that we've all been practicing uh gratitude we talked about that last week uh, every day just some small thing that we're grateful for i've been doing this and i find it it helps to expand the mind a little bit and remind us that there are some wondrous things happening in our world along with all the other difficulties that we're all facing. So I'm gonna talk about patience today. Uh, I had watched the news like many of you and um, I can see that uh, particularly here in the United States of America, we're becoming a bit impatient with the current situation. And this is not to say that the situation isn't difficult, of course it is. And particularly for those whose livelihoods have been so impacted and uh, food sources, all of these kinds of things, it's difficult. And it's difficult for me too. So I don't want to sit here and say, oh yes, patience, you know. <laughs> but I do wanna talk about it because I think uh, we misunderstand it a bit, and if ever, if not now, to practice it, when, really. So patience, just to put a definition out there, is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting upset or angry. Wow, there, and from Buddhist philosophy, patience is forbearance, to withstand something, something to endure, tolerance, so these are very active ways of looking at patients that require some effort on our part. Um, it's so important to say we are not submitting to abuse or exploitation, okay? That, that is absolutely not a part of patients, and we need to know that. For those of you who know me, you know that I always like to find some science study or something to back me up. I'm always looking for that. And this is the most uh, unbelievable thing that happened to me this week. So I'm looking for patients. I'm looking all over the internet. I seem to be having a lot of trouble. I'm not trying to do a deep dive or a doctorate here. I'm just trying to find a couple of academic papers on patients. And there's hardly anything to find. And then I find a paper that was written by three scholars, one from Baylor, one from Fuller, and one from the University of Southern California, uh, commonly known as USC in LA. Um, and this paper was just written last year. Okay, so I'm just gonna read this to you because this just, I mean, I don't often get shocked like this, but I was shocked by this. Because patience, I'm quoting, because patience has long been neglected in Western culture dialogue, 
few theoretical resources are available to positive psychologists who wish to better understand the virtue of patience. Thus, it is necessary to move beyond present culture to mine insights from other cultures or historical eras. Although ideas may be extracted from a plethora of religious traditions, Buddhism being one, <laughs> to build a theoretical understanding of patience. So they're trying, they're, the, the purpose of this, I'm going to skip over, was to ge is to generate a theoretical model of testable hypothesis related to the virtues of patience for the secular world. They're trying to build it on that. And in 2019, there's nothing in the secular community about patience. I was just shocked. So no wonder our culture knows nothing about it. Now, they cite a 2007 paper, and in that paper, it talked about the cultural bias, you know, that people see it as a weakness. You know, I think this comes from Darwinism and so many other things. But anyway, let's, let's just talk about it from Buddhist point of view. And not even, let's just talk about it from Buddhist psychology, okay? And how we can incorporate this such an important aspect, and particularly right now when we're all up against it, right? So I want to tell this little story. I know that many of you who have been in these circles have heard this story, but I want to tell it anyway. So um, think old Tibet, and uh, a herdsman encounters a hermit, okay? So the hermit was living alone in a cave, because, you know, where else would a hermit be living? And a herdsman is passing the cave and was curious, and he shouted up to the hermit and asked, hey, what, what are you doing alone up here in the middle of nowhere? And the hermit replied, I am meditating. You know, I'm meditating. And the hermit, uh, the herdsman asked him, what are you meditating on, right? What are you meditating on? And, um, and the hermit said, on patience. And so the herdsman, who must have had a wry sense of humor, uh, turned to go away and then said to the hermit, you can go to hell. And the hermit replied, what do you mean? You can go to hell. And the herdsman laughed and reminded the hermit he was supposed to be practicing patience. So this shows that people who are just completely away from society, they can think their practice is going quite well. But our practice depends upon others. It depends upon the situation that we find ourselves in. So here we are in this very difficult historical time, and we're going to need to have as much patience as possible. But it's an active process. So I just want to also say that um, there's this lovely book. Um, let me get my thing out of here. Uh, it's called Guide, you know, I know you guys, it looks backwards, but it's Guide to a Bodhisattva Way by Shantideva, who was a uh, saint, and in the 11th century, this was translated into Tibetan. So I'm just going to read you uh, something and then talk about the Dalai Lama's teachings on this, which uh, are pretty remarkable. So Shantideva, so you have to remember this 11th century, right? Shantideva says, where would there be leather enough to cover the entire world? The earth is covered over merely with the leather of my sandals. Likewise, I am unable to restrain external phenomena. So that means we're unable to restrain what's happening. It's happening, we ha you know, right now. We can't restrain it right? We cannot restrain external phenomena, but I shall restrain my own mind. And that's why we're here together today is to learn and become familiar and how to work with our mind in a very productive way, just like Shantideva taught us, right? What need is there to restrain anything else? And when we have restraint and patience over our mind, then we really are in much better shape than otherwise. So I just want to say uh, one other thing about this text and something um, that I'm so happy that I read. Uh, um, so in, in trying to find out more uh, and uh, re-familiarize myself with uh, 
teachings that I've had on patients. I, by the way, on this book, I actually studied this book with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in uh, July of tw July 20th through the 24th in 2008, Madison, Wisconsin. Maybe some of you were there. And then again, I went to uh, study the ninth chapter, which I hope to understand someday, uh, with Geshe Sopa, also in Wisconsin, the following year in Lama Zopa Rinpoche. So very privileged. I'm not saying I understand it, but I did study it. So uh, I went back and I read uh, a book, a small book, actually, a commentary that His Holiness the uh, Dalai Lama uh, was giving in 1996 on this very text in Arizona. And this is so beautiful, and I hope you think about this, because I've been thinking about it and telling my friends about this comment. And he said, um, His Holiness said, our, the fundamental way we are, the, we as human beings, just as human beings in this world, we are nurtured by affection. We understand when we feel affection from within. And for this reason, and this I think is so profoundly beautiful, for this reason we can infer our fundamental nature is gentleness. And our job is to rectify ourselves with this fundamental nature of gentleness. So we are already that. And so today I want us to think about as we meditate, this spacious mind we have with the capacity for all things, that the underpinning of all of this is your gentleness. And if you can allow the awareness of that to hold you, and it's okay if impatience arises because this is how we become familiar with it. These practices take a while. It doesn't happen right away. But this fundamental gentleness is holding you, holding us all. So let's meditate together with that and just feel that capacity within ourselves. Okay? So we'll start like we always do with a body scan just to kind of check how much tension we've been carrying. All right? So let's start with the top of our head. I carry so much tension there, I'm aware of. On that, on my skull. Just try and release as much as you can. Coming down to the eye sockets. Right, the jaw. Okay, just feel it kind of dangle there. Check your shoulders, maybe roll them back a little bit and roll them forward, loosen them up a little bit. Let your arms hang down, fingers dangle, letting go of any tension, any tightness. Soften the chest and the back, the belly. Coming down to the buttocks, just feeling the weight of the body, the solidity of it. Take your hands and put them back on your thighs if that helps. Loosen the calves and the thighs and the legs. Wiggle the toes. Just kind of one more time, just quickly let go of any tension. And now let's come into a meditation pose. Eyes cast down, a little bit of light coming through, or resting close, whatever is comfortable for you. Tongue on the top of the palate, right behind the front teeth. Chin straight, just not up here, not down, okay? Again, loosen the shoulders, soften the belly. Bring 
put your hands if you want in a meditation mudra right hand and left hand thumbs together a little bit of air going through okay feet on the ground remember we're circling the sun one more day now slowly raise the spine just raise it See if the mind becomes a little more alert. And now find your breath. Wherever it is prominent for you. Tip of the nose, the chest, the belly. Just notice it and say to yourself in order to anchor yourself in this present moment in out and when the mind runs away which it will just notice what it runs after and when you're aware that you're in the future or the past or chasing after sounds or sensations you just label that and come back to this breath this now in do not worry as the mind runs about finding the right label the label is not important the important aspect is just to note that you are not on the breath that your mind has chases chased after something and gently and kindly just say wandering and come back to the breath i'll talk more about that later in out
Where is the mind right now? Is it in the future or the past? Is it listening? Is it feeling sensations in the body? And come back to this breath in, out. If the mind has wandered, just notice, where is it? Is it engaged in a future or the past? Where did it run to? And just bring it back to this breath. In. Out.
So um, I want to uh, just say one thing. There was a question about labeling in meditation. I'm going to answer that. But I always like to honor the busy lives. I know even in these times, so I'd like to end on time. But Stephen and I are going to stay over and answer this question about labeling and how that works and some of the obstacles that people have. So I hope that whoever asked that stays with us. And the rest of you, if some of you have a question, please put it in there right now. Maybe we can uh, address that. This is an interactive medium and both Stephen and Seishu Ling, all of us want to be here to make this work for you in any way possible. But I do want to say this, remember, there's no bad meditation, okay? I know sometimes it feels that way. I've had that experience myself, but know that that's not true. It's always another drop in this amazing uh, mind that we have in this ocean of compassion and this gentleness. So uh, to just know that, just, just know that. So let's before I answer the question so other people can leave on time if they have something to do, let me, let's just dedicate and let's come from this space of gentleness that the Dalai Lama talks about and let us hold this whole earth and all the beings. May we all heal together. May we be better for it. So for those of you who have to leave, I want to thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, I hope to see you Friday for recharge meditation and next week on Tuesday, okay? And take good care. There's no bad meditation. And let's all work on patience this week, all right? So uh, now let me uh, address that question about labeling. This is a question that comes up all the time. So let me get the question right in front of me so that I um, don't misquote it. The question is, what is the function of labeling? It seems to lead me to some anxiety about coming up with the right label and taking me away from the meditation object even more. Okay, the function of it, um, and, and so what I would say is you're probably somebody that's smart and somebody that's really good and maybe likes to do things really well, the right way. So what happens with those of us who are like that is we're looking for the right label, to find the perfect label, and that's not the point. That's not the point at all. And, and anybody would have anxiety if we're trying to find the exact perfect word, right? I mean, that's just, that's not the issue. The issue about labeling is when the mind wanders as a waterfall, like it's just a waterfall of thoughts, what we're trying to do is become aware that we're just engaged in all these thoughts. And we're trying to come back to the object of the breath. It doesn't matter what the label is. Now, it can help eventually, but at this point, it doesn't matter. We're just going to call it whatever. It doesn't matter if it's future or past. We're just trying to get out of the seductive nature of this story we tell ourselves that is not part of what we want to do with meditation. But what I would say is I would be looking at this quality in yourself, this habit nature that we all have of trying to find the right label. Yeah, I wish there was just one perfect label. So some people use wandering. Some people get very specific, planning, talking, uh, you know, on a vacation, and they get more specific in it. Some people uh, use future, past, hearing, sensation, which you hear me say. And what I would do is I would also notice, what, why am I trying to come up with the perfect label? And I think it's to uh, quickly be able to come back to the breath. Like there's some going to be a magic word. But it is just the practice of seeing how the mind runs away. Remember, everybody's mind runs away. Not just yours. Everybody does. But eventually it gets easier and easier. And try not to judge it. This, everybody goes through this. And it's fine. There's no bad meditation. You're doing great. 
So just gently, gently, and very kindly with yourself. And notice when you're not kind. Notice when the anxiety rises. And, and then just take a deep breath. Let it go. So I can get, I want, I guess what I want for you is to try to just find uh, something simple like wandering and come back to in and out and then notice when you're judging it or becoming anxious and then if you are becoming anxious open your eyes notice where you are count five things in the room computer phone wall chair right bell whatever is in your room then try again okay I hope that helps. And if not, write us and I'll try and come up with a better answer next time for you. Anyway, I hope you, I guess if that's it, we've got four minutes. Um, and, and feel free to ask questions. That's, that's why we're here. And I know it's a little awkward uh, in this format, but you know, we're all doing the best we can, right? I mean, this is how it is. So, um, let me know if that wasn't a great answer, and I'll talk to you more about it. I'm, I'm always happy to do that. All right, again, everybody, hope to see you um, Friday, 4 o'clock. All right, bye. I'm having trouble turning off. I can't believe this.